genocide doesn't happen by accident. It is not inadvertent. Genocide is a deliberate intended project. A hate campaign is orchestrated to demonize and mobilize people against a targeted group. People have been uprooted from their homes, forcibly uprooted from their homes by government forces, and have been herded in concentration camps for more than 10 years. I'm talking about 2 million people in conditions which are abominable because of the conditions imposed in the camp. People are dying at the rate of 1,500 so-called excess deaths per week in these camps, meaning 1,500 people are dying because of the conditions imposed in the camp. Government officials say, you know, those people, they are not human beings, they are biological substances. We shall make them become like the insanity insects. You know, you know what happens to them when you trap them in a bottle and you close the lid. This is reminiscent of what we heard in uh, Rwanda. This is the worst form of genocide, the worst case of genocide I know in recent and present times. And certainly this situation is far worse than the abominations of uh, Darfur. It is incomprehensible that the international community have turned a complete blind eye to what is happening in northern Uganda, that there's been a conspiracy of silence, that those who should be speaking out from the rooftops about the genocide in northern Uganda, governments who believe and espouse human rights, NGOs who espouse human rights, the United Nations agencies, that there has been a concerted conspiracy of silence with regard to the genocide in northern Uganda. This is unforgivable. We've said over and over again, you know, following the Holocaust in Europe, never again. But it was after the fact. We said in the Balkans, never again. It was after the massacres of children and women had been accomplished and done. In Rwanda, we stood by and watched. We knew the facts. And after that, we said, never again. We said, not on our watch. The genocide in northern Uganda is happening on our watch. We have the information. We know what is going on. How shall we explain to the children of northern Uganda when they ask how come the international community stood by when our people, our land was being destroyed? It's often said, for example, that, say in a kind of banal way, that uh, the truth is the first casualty of war. Uh, there's a large grain of truth in that, in probably all wars. But in the case of Uganda, and northern Uganda in particular, this has been taken to a whole different level. Uganda was once coined the Pearl of Africa by Winston Churchill. Located in East Africa, it is a former British colony slightly smaller than the state of Oregon. Nearly one-fifth of Uganda is covered in water, allowing for the use of hydropower and enough arable land to potentially produce enough food to feed all of Africa. Uganda's southern border is Lake Victoria, which holds the mouth of the River Nile. The River Nile splits Uganda in half, with a Choli land in the northern region. The southern region houses the majority of the population, along with the capital city of Kampala and the government and parliament infrastructure. On October 9, 1962, Uganda gained its independence from Britain, with Milton Obote being voted in as Prime Minister. A year later, in 1963, Uganda became a republic. In 1967, Obote introduced a new constitution that promised to give more control to the central government, especially to the office of the president. 
But in January 1971, Obote was ousted in a coup led by Major General Idi Amin. Although Amin encountered some resistance by troops loyal to Obote, by the end of 1971, he had established control of the government. In 1976, Amin declared himself president for life and began a campaign to claim areas of surrounding countries for Uganda. These attempts failed. In 1979, it resulted in a counteroffensive by Tanzania. During this counteroffensive, Tanzania succeeded in unifying anti-Amin forces into the Ugandan National Liberation Front, or UNLF. On April 11, 1979, the Tanzanian army captured Kampala, and Amin fled. Amin's rule was notorious for its brutality, with an estimated 300,000 killed during the 1970s, most of them being Acholi. Little did the Acholi know, 25 years later, they would again be a targeted group, this time under a different leader, President Yoweri Museveni. The UNLF formed an interim government. The Uganda People's Congress, or UPC, won the majority of the seats in the 1980 parliamentary election, thereby ushering in Milton Obote as president of Uganda once again. A young Yoweri Museveni, who didn't win a single seat for his party in the election, declared this voting process rigged and began a guerrilla warfare campaign against the central government. Museveni launched his guerrilla warfare campaign in the Luero Triangle. The Luero Triangle is where many Ugandans had thought they had witnessed the worst atrocities in the country's history, until the concentration camps of present-day northern Uganda. When you're talking about the camps, as somebody who's educated and who at least can trace history of things, I will not tell you that we came yesterday to the camp today. I must first of all tell you what brought us to the camp, how? By 1997, the Ugandan government had fully enacted the policy of forcibly displacing Acholi civilians from their homesteads and villages. Blaming their need to move the population on an ongoing war between the government and a rebel group called the Lord's Resistance Army, or the LRA, the people were forced into these camps by a government campaign that involved bombing villages, burning down houses and entire communities, threats, killings, and intimidation by Museveni's army. Once the people were gathered in the camps, they were told that if they were found outside the camp, they would be considered a rebel or a member of the LRA and would be beaten, raped, or killed. So that was a move by the government and it was intended for just maybe a few weeks or months, but that has exceeded the, the limit they had planned for. You are a force away. And actually, by the way, it was the government of Uganda that told the people to leave their homes and comes into the camps. And this was purposely done by the government, encouraged by the government. Some people on their own had already migrated to live in the safe zone. The Ugandan army gave the people of the north only 48 hours to vacate their villages and move to the camps. Anyone that was left in the evacuated area was shot by government soldiers or killed from helicopter gunships. Being forced to leave under such duress, many could only take very few of their belongings and supplies with them. Current numbers in the north are staggering. According to a joint report by the World Health Organization and the Ugandan Ministry of Health, people are dying at the rate of between 1,000 to 1,500 excess deaths per week due to the conditions imposed on them in these concentration camps. They had to force us into what? Into camps. I'm telling you the truth in the name of God. Nobody came to the camp here without being forced. I was forced. These real people were almost shot by mobile force. They were asked to leave within only two hours. This is an evacuation letter from the 9th Battalion to the ADEC Division regarding mobilization. Please tell all civilians in the area of ODEC Division all to move to ASET 
or Lalogi Division. All should be mobilized immediately to move as soon as you get this letter. Be informed, nobody should remain in the village. Signed, Jeffrey Sagawa, Captain, 9th Regiment, September 9th, 1997. Upon arriving at the designated campsites, they found nothing. It fell upon each family to construct their own shelters. The Ugandan government has termed these camps protected villages because they claim they were evacuating the people from the rural areas and placing them in protected areas away from the LRA rebels. Outside observers have referred to them as death camps. Those who are called internally displaced and refugees are the same people. Refugees simply happen those to be those who fled from danger and crossed their national borders into another country. And internally displaced persons are often those who have fled from danger and gone to a safer area within their own country, seeking refuge within their own country. Well, these people didn't do that. What happened in northern Uganda is reminiscent of what happened in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge uprooted entire populations and took them to a particular location. In South Africa, under apartheid, when one fine morning, huge populations were rounded up, taken uprooted from their lands, and confined in particular areas. That is what happened in northern Uganda. These are not so-called IDP camps. They are not camps of populations who run away voluntarily from their homes to seek protection in these camps. Rather, people were forced into what are definitionally internment camps or concentration camps. You know what is happening in these camps is genocide writ large. None of these and more aspects of the situation that I or some other person could tell you on their own separately make any sense except when you put it all together in the context of a genocide project, voila, it all falls into place. It's a multi-dimensional project in which you attack the livelihood, you attack the economy, you attack the culture, you attack education and the children, public health, as well as physically eliminating the and you impose conditions that facilitate the, the erosion, the destruction of the viability of that society. What is then left would be an existential shadow of a once vibrant society from every point of view. And that is exactly what is happening in Northern Uganda today. Let's, be, let's, let's have no confusion about that. Now, genocide is a precise project. According to the 1948 Convention, genocide is a project or campaign directed against a targeted group with the purpose of destroying it in whole or in part. A genocide project aims to destroy in whole or in part key aspects of the viability of the targeted community. In particular, its physical preservation, livelihood, culture, children, physical and emotional health, and family life and structure. That is what genocide is. Now, who is the agent of genocide? What is the agency of genocide in Northern Uganda? Because genocide is a deliberate project. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen because a few soldiers are indisciplined, because a few battalions are not under control. No, 
genocide is a project. It doesn't happen by inadvertence. And the agency of genocide in northern Uganda is the president of the Republic of Uganda, Mr. Joe Wilson. Again, let's be very clear. Museveni has been president of Uganda since January 26, 1986. Upon failing to gain entry into Makerere University in Kampala, the young Museveni was recommended by President Milton Obote to the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Upon graduation, Museveni joined the Ugandan Intelligence Service and was a close aide to Milton Obote. In January 1971, Idi Amin seized power via a military coup. With Amin fully in power and declaring himself president for life, Museveni and a group of supporters returned to Tanzania with the intention of launching an armed insurrection. By 1972, Museveni had formed the Front for National Salvation. For NASA, as it was called, was a Marxist guerrilla group, which operated out of Tanzania and carried out covert missions inside Uganda. For NASA specialized in kidnapping and assassinating key military and political leaders within the Ugandan government. Museveni blamed the assassinations on Idi Amin. In April 1979, when the Amin government fell, Museveni was named the new Minister of State for Defense. In 1980, Museveni's party suffered a humiliating defeat in the Ugandan general election. After Milton Obote won the presidency, Museveni claimed the election was rigged. He fled to the bush and launched a guerrilla war against the very man who had helped him. On February 6, 1981, Museveni and a band of over 30 armed men attacked a police barrack in the central Mubunde district. This was a historic moment. Not only was Museveni the first African to launch a guerrilla war against a duly elected government, but he also introduced the concept of using child soldiers. In the ensuing five-year civil war, over 300,000 civilians were massacred in an area of central Uganda known as the Luero Triangle. The Museveni-led faction known as the NRA, or National Resistance Army, blamed the massacres on government troops. The government insisted it was Museveni himself who had committed the atrocities against the civilian population. Museveni himself while negotiating with Tito Okello in Nairobi, boasted of having wiped out 40,000 UNLA troops. I can assure you that those could not be UNLA troops. It was only a brigade that fought Museveni in Luero. A brigade consists of 3,000 people. And the whole army of the UNLA in Uganda at the time I was in power, was the whole total was 37. Now, assuming that Museveni killed every member of the brigade, the 5th Brigade, which operated in Luero, which was 3,000 people. The question now is, who are the other 37,000 people whom Museveni and his NRA, NRM killed in Luero? Milton Obote's presidency would not live to see the next election, as he was removed from office in a non-violent military coup by Tito Okello. In an effort to unite Ugandans, Tito Okello felt it necessary to enter negotiations with Museveni and his NRA rebels. In the Nairobi Peace Accord, signed December 17, 1985, Museveni was to lay down his arms and serve as the vice president under Okello, forming a new peaceful government. This did not last long as Museveni turned on his own government, taking over the parliament building in Kampala in January 1986, declaring himself the new president. Between 1986 and 1991, the new government under Museveni enjoyed widespread international support. With funds flowing from the West, Museveni quickly renounced his Marxist beliefs. But for us, we've been handling these problems ourselves. We should, uh, really need a little bit of a medro from uh, the World Bank <laughs> on handling multiple problems, balancing the budget, dealing with the bandits, dealing with the hostile neighbors, with only $17 million. Uh, it's quite a miracle. Right? You should make a statue for me in the, in the World Bank and IMF. Say, small statue, say this is a man. <laughs> Museveni formed a one-party system that he referred to as the movement system. All oppositional political parties were banned, and any public gathering whose purpose was political was considered treason. In 2003, Museveni started a campaign to end presidential term limits imposed by the 1995 Constitution, and in 2005, the Constitution was amended. In 2006, in controversial elections, Museveni was again elected to the office of president. You hear a good deal about the LRA and the government. 
and it all gets confounded. Who is doing what? Well, again, let me just very quickly say that the LRA is one in a line of various rebel groups which have emerged in Uganda. Some emerged in, in the western part of the country, others emerged in the east, others emerged in the north, others emerged in the west Nile. All the others were defeated in relatively quick order. Well organized, well armed, politically coherent, or all defeated. What has come in the way and has not been defeated for all these years is something called the Lord's Resistance Army. When the term rebel is used in Uganda, it most often refers to the LRA, or Lord's Resistance Army. The LRA is a rebel group operating out of northern Uganda, southern Sudan, and the eastern Congo. They have been labeled as a religious faction and have shouldered the majority of blame for the killing, mutilations, and abduction of children in northern and eastern Uganda. In order to obtain anti-terrorism funding from western nations, Museveni has successfully had them and their leader, Joseph Kone, placed on the U.S. terrorist watch list. The LRA claims the government of Museveni is responsible for the atrocities committed against the people of the North, and therefore must be overthrown in order for peace to be restored in northern Uganda. That group is being responsible, as we know, for massive abduction of children. It's being responsible for maiming the local community. It's being responsible for committing atrocities in various uh, the LRA. The LRA. Why is the LRA doing this? Whenever they've had opportunity to say anything, they blame the local population for not supporting them, for not supporting their war effort. And they call them collaborators. You are collaborating with the government. You inform on us with the government. That's why we must punish you and do this to you. That's the LRA. And the LRA must be held fully responsible for what they have done. About the atrocities that were committed, definitely the government of Yoweri Museveni had mounted an effective propaganda campaign against the resistance because fighting a war, you have to mount a propaganda campaign. Um, because if you examine prior to the coming of the NRA in Uganda, wars were actually conventional. There were no guerrilla wars. And there were no wars directed at civilians, like of mutilation. But with the coming of the NRA, that kind of, uh, atroc those kind of atrocities began. Even when you look in Congo, where the Uganda army invaded, there were also the cutting of leaves, there's also the cutting of uh, hands, the mutilation of civilians. And personally, I'm glad that the key leaders have now been formally indicted by the International Criminal Court and they have to go before that court sooner or later. But I have to tell you something else. Something else. That is only one dimension, one aspect of what is happening in Northern Uganda. Very sadly, very cynically, Mr. Museveni is using the LRA factor, using the LRA presence to provide a cover, to provide a pretext for conducting genocide in the camps. And as long as the NGOs, the United Nations and governments and the media are going on exclusively about the LRA and the abduction of children, Bravo! The government applauds them and gives them all the opportunity to say more and more and to define the situation exclusively in those terms, in these one-dimensional terms. Because that way, the sight of the world, the eyes of the international community, is then completely diverted from what the government is doing in the camps. There are commentators and journalists who have gone all the way to northern Uganda. They have met the children who have been uh, escaped from the LRA. They have been to interview them. They have done long stories. Only a couple of miles away are the camps. They have not set foot in the camps. One, the government doesn't want people to know, the world to know. 
So it gives its own version of events. Uh, it is well known how even journalists are uh, to get briefings from the army. So would the army turn around and say, we have had a uh, uh, an engagement with the rebels and 20 of our soldiers were killed? They would never say that. That's the first thing. Secondly, the LRA itself uh, is guilty of not informing the world. The LRA did not have an effective uh, propaganda machinery or information machinery to disseminate its information to the rest of the world. So it was up to the Uganda government to say anything and then the world would believe. But the truth is that uh, there is a lot that is not known about this war. And that is because there was only one way of information, only one source of information, and that is the government army. The army spokesman would brief the journalists, would tell them this and this happened. And the LRA did this. And the, the, the journalists would, would relay that, and the world would believe. The government of Uganda has been concealing information from the international com community. Nobody knows about what is happening in northern Uganda. What the world knows about northern Uganda is that LRA is the only killer. What the world knows about northern Uganda is that all the atrocities have been committed by the LRA only. And yet, the reality on the ground shows very clearly that even the UPDF have committed a lot of violations of human rights of our people in northern Uganda. Um, when the government forced the people into the camps to protect them, alleged uh, ostensibly, if you see the structure of the camps, the military barracks were at the center of these camps. So if the army really wanted to protect these people, then it should have deployed a circle to surround the camps. But if you go to the camps, even today, you'll find that the military barracks are right at the center. Instead, the civilians in their huts were all over surrounding the, 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 the barracks. So the, the, the civilians were actually being used as human shields by the army. Uh, the night when, uh, when the rebels attacked uh, the seminar here, there were about five uh, UPDF soldiers. But when they saw the rebels in big number, they disappeared. And uh, the seminarians and the people, the population here, we, were, we felt completely abandoned without any protection. At Kao Parabek, it was NRA soldiers who killed the people. Straightforward. There's no question about it. 27 people were killed in the Kao Parabeke Trading Center. The massacre at Yulele. That was purely UPDF, 1,450 mass grave. It's there. Documented, seen. That was not Kony. Because Kony as a rebel, let's just assume he did it. He has no time to dig a mass grave and bury 1,400 people. Okay. And it was you who was the governor. That is Museven. You cannot, on the other hand, say that no, it is somebody else who came from elsewhere who came to do the killing. And strangely enough, it's important for the Ugandans to realize that skulls cannot speak. These testimonials were taken in 2006 from one of over 200 internment camps in northern Uganda. The name of the camp and the people will remain anonymous in order to protect them from government retaliation. The level of propaganda, the use of language, the way in which the narrative is framed, these are very important aspects of the phenomenon of deception and disinformation 
which has defined the last 20 years in Uganda. Another example I can give you. And by the use of language, I mean using language and words that mean one thing, but using those words and language to hide something else, to hide the truth. You use it to mean the opposite of what is going on. For example, when the camps, when people were uprooted from their homes, the government said people are running away from the LRA. But this is a lie. <laughs> the vast majority of the people in the camps did not run away from their villages. They did not voluntarily leave their lands and, and homes. In these camps, you got a control environment. People are forced into it. And you impose on the populations living conditions so abominable that uh, preventable diseases become rampant. So people are dying from malaria, from diarrhea, uh, you know, from very banal preventable uh, diseases in large numbers. People have been forced to live in the IDP camps under terrible, unspeakable conditions. You have abominable sanitation conditions. You've got 4,000 people on average, 4,000 people using one public latrine. Which means uh, it must be something about maybe 15 seconds per day per person in terms of access. The women have to line up to get water. It can take three days to get to a water source where you can obtain one jerry can of water. If it's taken you 12 hours, you are very lucky. In fact, a United Nations uh, report in uh, November after visiting these camps said the death rates in these camps, the mortality rates in the camps in northern Uganda are twice the mortality rates in Darfur in western Sudan. But as I talk today, Many camps in the Chulisa region have got motorized pump water systems. Motorized where, where they are pumped, solar pumping system in the reservoir and people are fetching tap water. Sanitation, a lot of activity has been done to put latrines and so on. In those camps, there have been improved conditions. The health of the children are improving because the conditions are improving and government have invested a lot in that one. The hygiene within the camps, uh, every time there is an outbreak of disease, it spreads very fast uh, because within the same place, uh, maybe within a radius of uh, maybe five meters, you've got your heart there. Uh, if there are some people who are keeping animals like pigs, the pig sty is also there and then the toilet is also very near there and then running water from another bathroom is running passing probably next to your house. So that is hell on earth. So virtually no access to latrines, no access to water for these populations. A recent report by the United Nations said quite simply access to health care is virtually non-existent. I mean, one do you need any pecky, one to take it, you come in any, and that won't any.
Ma pega wa don tia teka ma don iyo pe bera yo mi eko cha na ma tia bina ma ni kum tua pe do ram chang cha na da ta lang pe ye nang pe kabur rang pe pe do ti mo yo maro. And you can imagine this kind of conditions will never be acceptable in any country in the world, even in Uganda. If it were happening in Kampala, I don't think. If they were provided with adequate food and water and resources, they would be legal under the Geneva Conventions. However, the reality of the situation has been widely divergent from that and the government's sort of propaganda. That's a horrible place. And um, it is only that that Chile people have a very strong culture. Otherwise, if it was other communities, people have uh, made a lot of demonstrations and riots uh, because of the condition in the camps. The control, the conditions that we are describing in the camps have been deliberately imposed they're being deliberately maintained by the government forces. They are not accidental. Hmm? They're not accidental. And the government itself has a long trail of atrocities committed in northern Uganda, which is being shielded by the presence of the LRA. The LRA, of course, have been doing this. to our people, to our children. The government soldiers also have been doing almost the same thing. For instance, rape has become the weapon of war against the people of northern Uganda. This is the testimony of a UPDF commander in northern Uganda who wished to remain anonymous. I know many soldiers who have raped both men and women in the north of Uganda. Soldiers who say openly that I want to infect my enemy enemies before I die. In northern Uganda, rape is a constant fear for women and girls. This woman's husband was sodomized in front of her. She was then raped severely by many government soldiers to the point where she can no longer walk or stand properly. Women and their daughters sometimes are raped in the presence of their husbands and children. Not just to humiliate the victim, but also to dehumanize the community of northern Uganda to demonize them. And when things like that happens, the community are forced to wash it from the position of helplessness and hopelessness. This war, the so-called war, the NRA war, is being the best foil by which Mr. Museveni thinks he can gain and retain power, to divide and rule. You lose support from me, you vote me out, you don't like me, very well, Joseph Kony is coming. You wait for him, he's coming from across the night. Huh? I am your protector, I'm your strong man. So rally around me, Turn a blind eye to what is being done there. As Mr. Mwanje, the, 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 the writer based in Kampala, he went up north, visited the camps, and he came and wrote, I quote, Ugandans in the south don't know about the genocide being committed across the river Nile. The UPDF, the army of the government, is demoralized. Two, there are many commanders within the UPDF 
who saw the war in northern Uganda as a way of enriching themselves. Um, by this I mean the government allocated a, a big budgetary um, resource to ending the conflict. But this resource ended up into the pockets of the army commanders. The army com That's a very strong case uh, uh, for the continuation of the war in northern Uganda. The army commanders uh, saw the war as a way of minting money, fuel money, money for running the, 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 the vehicles, the army trucks, the armored vehicles, money for paying salaries, money for whatever military operation was undertaken. A substantial part would go to the pockets of these commanders. And so an end to the war uh, would mean an end to that. Third, uh, and I think more unfortunately, uh, the evil design against the people of northern Uganda. Um, as I said, the NRA government perceived the people of northern Uganda as being the people who resisted most against their rule. And so if these people were brought to their knees, then there would be no more opposition to the NRA government. So the NRA government would rule Uganda for as long as it wants. There is the 50-year plan, master plan, for the people of Museveni to establish their hegemony, their rule over the people of Uganda. And so they know that it is only the people of northern and eastern Uganda who came up very strongly against that. So if those people are defeated uh, through an atricious war, a war over, over a length of time, then they would be impoverished. They would not, uh, they would be marginalized from the political um, life of the country. And so they would, they would be permanently be down. That's why some of us tend to think that although it was not a government policy to, to, to let the war go on, but within the commanders that were benefiting from this war in terms of getting more funding, we tend to think that that could have been a problem because they were getting corrupt ghost workers, they get increased more money, the commanders, but the other young people, the fighters who were dying, had no interest in this war. I'm the victim, one of the victims of this war in northern Uganda. My daughter was taken by force by the rebels in 1987 and she was raped, actually gang raped by the, the rebels. After that terrible ordeal, she committed suicide. After 10 years, my wife went home to her village and as she was coming back to town in Kidgo, her vehicle hit the landmine and she was blown into pieces. She died. I felt like a tree split from top to bottom by lightning. As you know, we speak about the war in northern Uganda. There is no war in northern Uganda. How many times have you heard of a battle going on between government forces and the LRM, so many killed on this side, so many killed on that side. How many times? There are very few, few and far between incidental skirmishes. This conflict, so-called war, is marked by the fact that the government forces and the LRM never engage each other. They engage the local population, they brutalize the local population, they don't engage each other. And as many of you who know, the know the terrain is rather flat, the savanna. If you're coming from the Sudan border all the way to the to the to the, the night, walking, they are not mechanized. <laughs> they are walking on foot. Huh? Many of them are 
have shoes, so they can't even walk fast. <laughs> huh? With tattered clothes on their back, everybody sees them. Yes. And they go and say to the, to the, to the battalion, by the way, they are there, they are moving there. And the fellows laugh and drink and say, oh, thank you. so they are there. They used to tell us, he used to explain to us, that the terrain, <laughs> We would come, they say, terrain is so bad, now the rain has come, now the bush is wrong, now, oh my goodness, it was endless, endless. I'm telling you, Ugandans have gone through agony of the war in the north. We don't have any joy, we don't have happiness. But there were all these excuses. And we used to tell him, but why do you tell people that you are going to deal with the man? Because he would do ego, this ego I told you. Tomorrow I will finish him, I will crush him. But tomorrow he doesn't crush him. The man crushes more people. Right from the beginning when this war began, the government has always, the government of Uganda has always been emphasizing on the military solution. That is, fight them and, and finish them. Finish them with the guns. But the government after today, 20 years, has not succeeded. This is not to say that our president also doesn't have too much ego. And I think actually one of the problems why the war goes on and on and on is this ego of President Museven. He doesn't want to be defeated. He wants to defeat him militarily and then he's not even managing it. But he doesn't want to show that he is defeated. The president of Uganda gave a statement that is known to everybody in Uganda. That, you see, I have already put grasshoppers and locked them up in the bottle. They are now eating themselves. I don't know whether this is a proverb or just a kind of word. This is something that Museveni cannot explain. Why, 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 why is the LRA a convenient president for Mr. Museveni? There are several factors. We've got to be very clear about this. First, as I said, it provides the cover and the pretext for a genocide project that Museveni has been working on for a long, long, long time. This is well documented and well recorded. Mr. Museveni, not the Baganda, not the Banyankole. Mr. Museveni, Mr. Yoweri Museveni. I have put them in the bottle, closed them up, they are eating one another. He doesn't refer to these people as a children. Nisenene is a kind of grasshopper. I put this Nisenene in the, in the bottle, they are now eating up one another. And if you look at what is happening now, it is exactly what he stated. They actually are killing one another. So if that, this war is to end, maybe we can ask somebody who predicted that why don't you open up the bottle and some send them a flee or perhaps escape. So it is difficult to tell when this war will end because the man who put the thing in the bottle has not opened the bottle. One of the most uh, tragic and virtually irreparable loss out of this genocide is the destruction of a truly culture and civilization. Okay. The same culture that has brought us world-renowned people like scholar, playwright, and author Akot Pavitek, international diplomat Olera Tuno, and Anglican Archbishop Jenini Luam, who was murdered by Idi Amin for his stand on human rights. The Achuri society is renowned for its 
deep-rooted and rich culture, value system, and family structure. All these have been destroyed under the living conditions prevailing over the last 10 years in these camps. This loss is colossal and virtually irreparable. It seeks not the death of a people and their civilization. I mean, Acholi have always prided themselves on their independence, on their ability to, you know, to live out in the countryside, and all of that, all of those values are suddenly made a mockery of in a situation like a camp, where you have 70,000 people living in one, trying to live together in one square kilometer. Latin <laughs> Latin buru kama be la nyal ben pingeone latin na buru nyo kama nyo to te kwa me la man wan nyo ko ati tino e di pasu nu ati tino da ti pat jem du sha man dong petie die gi petie dog du petie gwen petie man mi te kwa wa dong gor but the conditions imposed in the camps have systematically destroyed this because there's no longer the teaching of this culture the way they were at, at home. There's no longer the relationship between parents and children. Parents have nothing to offer their children. Traditionally, their children, parents live for their children, feeding them, paying whatever sacrifice to make them go to school, ensuring their well-being. Now they can't. and you can imagine the generation of Achori people of 20 years has seen nothing like peace, has seen nothing like normal life. Now what sort of people are they? The heart, the pain, the, 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 the psychological. All they've seen, recruited into the army, made to kill people, made to eat whatever. The, these people, these children, that is a generation lost. What shall we do? I don't want to get it. I want to get it. I want to get I want to get it. The values, the ethics of the society is all being destroyed. Until being forced into the camps, the Acholis built and maintained one of the richest, most vibrant cultures to be found anywhere. Yeah. Well, growing up with Sanachot was uh, a very delightful experience. 
because at that time there was peace and harmony within the society of Achille. And Achille people have a lot of cultures that are attached to the community that makes growing up uh, quite easy because everybody takes care of every children. <laughs> This is one of the richest, deepest civilization, culture, value system anywhere. The moral values of the people in northern Uganda, of the Asuli people, is gone. When I was growing up as a younger boy, I um, had no idea of uh, feminist values, uh, very stupid patriarchal mentality. Uh, we used to talk and say, oh, if you really want to get married and you want to find a woman that will never cheat on you, there were three places to go to. Go and get an actual woman, they were number one. Nkikaramojong, number two, and Rugubara, number three. Okay? Those people, we knew those were very tight girls who will never give it up. Since people don't have much money to buy things, young ladies intend to go about and then the spread of HIV is uh, terribly high here. You go to Kampala today, and you go to what we call the Kampala Red District, around the Speak Hotel. The majority of the core girls, the Red District, are from Achori. That's destruction of a culture. That's part of genocide. What have they done, these innocent children? What have they done to this situation? What have they done to NRM government? What have the children done? You can kill the big people. Maybe they have abused you. Maybe they have rejected you to vote for you. But what have the children done? Very significantly, Uganda must be the only place on earth where HIV AIDS is now being deliberately used as a weapon of mass destruction. Uganda has one million soldiers. More than one third of them are HIV positive. The NRA soldiers are the rulers of Uganda. One of their weapons is AIDS a weapon equally as powerful, effective, and deadly as any gun ever invented. Rape and sexual exploitation, particularly by government soldiers, have become routine. According to Human Rights Watch, I quote, women in a number of camps told how they have been raped by soldiers from the Ugandan army. It is exceptionally difficult for women to find protection from sexual abuse by government soldiers. And the, the government screens the soldiers, the UPDF soldiers. Those who have tested positive, HIV positive, they are then especially deployed to the north with a clear mission to do the maximum havoc on local women and the local girls. You need that actually. 
They, they, they do what they want with any woman or girl and rape and sexual exploitation become entirely routine in northern Uganda. Some boy took us to a village near Agum. Government troops ravaged his home on April 17, 1991. They raped the family of Juliana Ayeko, as reported by Amnesty International. A neighbor of the family recalls this terrible night. Soldiers came at 9 p.m. with torches in their hands. They forced us to leave the hut and demanded money. Since we didn't have any, they beat and kicked us. Ayeko is still unable to walk a year after being raped and beaten. Then the soldiers raped me. I screamed with pain. I saw how they raped my wife and my daughter-in-law. The child was on my lap when the soldiers came. I screamed, leave me alone, I have a child, but to no avail. I put the child on my shoulder like this while I held him there. I was being raped. Obedi <laughs> Namane, Parbuman, 
par bije pieri we bor a ke mwa ka mere bero ti ke mwa pia na yo so we are witnessing a deliberate a most deliberate use of hiv aids as a weapon of genocide that is what is going on in northern uganda and this this at a moment when the world celebrates uganda as the model example of the fight against hiv aids Ben duri ko ba eh what it me na kar kar mo kan ne tem na ne chang ki dugu chang na tem na ne chang ki dugu ki no ngo no te wo te joni ma joni ki kan ki ten ne ta na en tin mo kan me consequently the rate of hiv infection has exploded there from near zero to the staggering levels of between 30 and 50% compared to a national infection rate of 6.4%. Mm, I heard that AIDS can hide in your body for a long time. Now already there is blood in my stool. Of course I know that there is no medication against this deadly virus. Like many people in this area, I will die. Mana wan ti gang kon ko da por wai gang ti dong chir mwa ka bi chir nyon ma ra nyon ha chi dong ta ra ta. Kita lagi nado cuer cuci mikir tu, eh ni pi ada monyet kan? Cie boom, mana orang kembali rio? Cie, dah nampak tak mana? Buat mana tu? Ya dong yang tiada tu cie. Ada ni dia, ni mahu yang kerja cie kalau ni, no yang kira mana? Blok aw, kena blok aw dulu, no merum yang pakai tu aw. Kau dah kau tu aw nak cie ke tu ada remoh? Karena yang tiada tak mana cie cie, buat tu dia macam. Uganda is one of the countries benefiting from the global fund making available anti-retroviral uh, uh, drugs for populations uh, uh, infected by HIV AIDS. Well, it's very instructive. Even though Uganda has been a beneficiary of the global fund and even though antiretroviral drugs have been available, the populations in the camps those most in need of the drugs have not been benefiting from them. They have not been made available to those populations in the camps. In the face of this relentless cultural and personal humiliation, suicide has risen to alarming levels, being highest among mothers. In August last year, 13 mothers committed suicide in Abo County alone. The ones rich and deep and truly count. Value system and family structure have been destroyed under years of the conditions imposed in these concentration camps. I know I'm a bit of a joke, but you know, I'm a bit of a joke. 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 I'm a bit of a joke.
Here is one of the many educational institutions in northern Uganda never threatened by the conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army and the government. Somehow a strong educational system had managed to survive the political and social turmoil from Idi Amin and the various governments leading up to Museveni. However, most of these institutions in the north were left to decay under the Museveni regime. Meanwhile, schools in the south and west continued to thrive. In the 1990s, the World Bank initiated policies of debt relief under HIPC, or Highly Indebted Poor Countries, wherein Uganda was one of the beneficiaries. One of the conditions for relief was the implementation of changes to social programs, including health and education. 53% of Uganda's annual budget comes from donor countries. Since the beginning of the Museveni regime, the emphasis on funding has always been on the military. There has always been resistance to the funding of education and health services. Various donors uh, are uh, obviously uh, cognizant of the problems that your country faces. Uh, especially in the north. Uh, but I have urged the Secretary of Defense uh, in writing, and I've also talked to your uh, uh, permanent secretary, Secretary of the Treasury, to address two issues with the donors. One is that is the level of defense expenditures and what it is that, you're, that you see you're doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, nobody's saying anything, and everybody's uh, drawing their own conclusions. The second thing in that defense expenditure is the question of the demobilized soldiers. And uh, I think you've got a problem in explaining to, to donors uh, the fact that they have paid for demobilization packages and some of these same people appear to be back in the armed services. And I, I urge you to deal with those issues in some way. No, well, you can't go to the other side without this base. I'm saying that if the people don't know how to read and write and count and add and subtract, they're not going to be able to engage in the modern age. Uh, that's all there is to it. But uh, obviously we agree that um, roads are essential for development. It's a question of whether it's the only thing you do or whether it's the first thing you do. Or... So my guess is you'll get your way, which I think you're used to doing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> look, look. We'll have a lot of undereducated people using the roads. <laughs> um, no problem. They, they will once they have got incomes. Yeah. Then they'll be yes, the yes, yes, yes. They, they can find their own education. Museveni started a policy which according to some of us would have been not, not missing. You see, you cannot make a policy as if you are trying to say trial and error. A whole president, don't you have advisors? Trial and error, right? You want to give in UPE, right? Universal primary education. That means you are going to push in more children to primary schools. But the first thing you do before you push children is to phase out primary teachers' colleges. Is that the right move? That is it's very logical. How can you remove TTCs? You want to, the children to go, very many of them. The first thing you do is to get rid of the teachers. What, what, what logic is there? When Museveni opened Easy UPE, after phasing out, uh, primary teachers' education in colleges. 
The children were there. In the heaps, P1, 200, P2, 150, maybe, and so on. I'm a teacher and teacher trainer. If you tell me to punish a teacher who is going to teach 200 children at a go because he has failed to manage the class, I think I will be very un uh, I will be unfair to punish the teacher. So what Museven has done with his UPE is to destroy education in Uganda. You know, many schools were burned or abandoned. You know, the quality when you go. When you go to some of these schools, especially the primary, you find, you know, children in one class there, like 100 plus, you know, children in the class, and maybe only two teachers, you know. How do you, how do you really reconcile this, you know, the proportion, the greater number with the number of the few, I mean, few teachers and educational facilities, you know, these are all big problems. These are big losses. You know, we have lost lives and we continue to lose lives. Uh, Self Science Learning Center, Tiki Primary School, Marama BCL. See, they come to school at BCL. They will point my people, my doom, the point of team who appear with a big camp. And I'll be a monotier, they over 1,000. My name is Clyde Asiel, that will be a death, new mere death appear. The normal class, as per since we took over from British, is 45. You teach that class, you are able to walk in the rows and do what we call individual coaching. In other words, you, you check each and see every child if the child is being educated. But now you give me 200 children. Within 40 minutes, only 40 minutes, 200 children. <laughs> Definitely. What kind of education? And Musebun is proud of that, by the way. You are proud of bringing 200 children in a class where they will not be supervised or be even coached. And you say, I've, I've done it. I've, I've, I've put more people in education. But are, are they educated? He was saying he has pushed them to education. But are they educated? This is one thing that should really be scrapped out. You cannot take one man to teach 200 children. This is young is playing board with your feet. The other one is singing. The other one is doing. What education is that? Museven is only proud of the number that has gone. But not who has got education. He only wants the number, not education. I think our oh, money. <laughs> Unless Museveni steps down, education in the north or even the east will never succeed. For me to be able to, st to sustain myself in power, there are two strong ethnic groups. So I have to make one with a boogie man and the other one, the good people. So if they try to oppose me, I will tell them, you see here, here is the boogie man coming to eat you. You can see they are, they are still fighting. They are still trying to come back to power, to kill you like they did in your world. So be careful, support me in whatever I do. And unfortunately, Baganda for my people, they fell into this trap. I, have, I saw headlines like Kababikube, which means let those beasts be killed in the newspapers. Every episode of genocide is intended, it is orchestrated, is leader led. Whether it is Hitler in Germany, is Museveni in Uganda, but somebody politically orchestrates it and somebody benefits from it politically. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a means of dividing and rule, it's a means of getting a scapegoat, it's a way of a, a political group, a, a party, a leader gaining and retaining power. Okay. You see this is a very consistent thing. And, in e and because of that therefore each of these situations 
that leader and those around that leader would orchestrate a campaign of hate, a campaign of bigotry against the targeted group. If there is any ethnic group outside the central region that has strong cultural values, the archories are up there. So there had to be a way to put the Achoris and the Baganda at conflict. That, that, that precedes and punctuates the genocide project. And in northern Uganda we've seen exactly this, where President Museveni has personally been orchestrating a very toxic campaign of of ethnic racism, mm -hmm. of hatred, of bigotry, of dehumanization directed against the Acholi in particular and other northerners and his associates have joined uh, in this. I mean, one, the, 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 the whole trail, a pattern, very well established pattern, you know, he'll say we haven't killed enough of them uh, we've not punished them enough. You wait and see, we'll teach them a lesson from which they'll never recover. Um, reminiscent of the Rwanda genocide, Ms. Museveni has said, you know, we, we'll, you wait and see what we'll do. They will be like insects, senene insects they're called in Uganda. When you put them in a bottle and you close the lid, you see what happens. Uh, um, uh, th 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 those people, these this are all racist typologies, those people and us, uh, those people they are swine, those people they are not human beings, they are biological substances, it's reminiscent of Hitler's Germany. So the, the the, the scenario in northern Uganda has been replete with all features, classical features of genocide. This has, Anasa has to be formed. This is the people, people like Gigi Ginyera Pinchwa, the most brilliant people in the country. And the war for the last 20 years is making them look at the southerners as people who have been manipulating them. And you can't blame them because they're the people who have been on the front line. So these issues have to be addressed very seriously if Uganda as a country is going to stay as one nation. Because what M7 is doing, for me, my grandmother is a Munyankore. But now there's a tendency among the Uganda to refer to all Banyankore as Rwandese. Because we see them as rooters, as foreigners, and the animosity is not good for the country. So Museveni's political behavior is causing total fragmentation of the country. Okay. The people from Ankore, they're not all bad. But because of the small clan of people from Ankore who are rooting the, ca the country, people look at Banyankore as people who are rooting the entire country for their own good. So the behavior of the government is going to cause a crisis where regions are going to be going after regions unless a solution is immediately formed. And this solution doesn't reside with Museveni. That's my major, major concern as of now. Right in the beginning, things were focused upon searches for hidden guns and things like this because the NRA was convinced that a lot of the ex uh, the soldiers who, of the army that they had kicked out, the ex-UNLA, they were convinced that a lot of them were sort of hiding out in the villages, had buried their guns, and were just waiting there for the time to relaunch their rebellion. So I think in, in these searches for UNLA, for weapons, um, a lot of abuses transpired that way. There were a couple episodes of very, um, there were a lot of, of cordon search operations that were going on where they would seal off an area. and search through everybody, they would make people go assemble, just, you know, things that 
a lot of most of it at that point was more of a matter of sort of humiliation and show, tr showing people that look we don't trust you we think you are you know the enemy and we are going to you know treat you as such there were also some episodes of 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 killings by by NRA soldiers things like that um, it wasn't until a few months after the occupation that violence by the NRA against the Acholi civilian population really escalated. And that's, if you talk to people now in Acholi land, that's the time when they start, when they, you know, start talking about real abuses by the NRA in terms of killings, in terms of, you know, even, even a few isolated massacres, in terms of rape, in terms of displacement, in terms of going into villages and forcing everybody out of the village. and searching the village, forcing people to assemble in, 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 in cities and then beating the men, or re arbitrary arrests all over the place, this kind of stuff. And so that began a period of uh, torture, a period of uh, suffering of the people. Um, specifically, there was a battalion within the National Resistance Army. It was uh, the 9th Battalion, according to my investigation. The 9th Battalion was a special b battalion formed within the National Resistance Army uh, that would go out and brutalize the people and create fear among the people so that um, uh, people would not rise up to oppose the new government. Uh, and therefore, um, a lot of atrocities began to be committed. For instance, uh, they began to tie people, this ex the unfortunate ex who were found, and the young people, they were tied up um, by a torture method called Kandoya, in which people were tied up in three pieces. Uh, actually, it was so severe that many people were incapacitated and even many people were killed. Um, yes, it was, uh, at that time, it was uh, uh, Tinyefunza. Yeah, it's a man called uh, Tinyefunza. When two armies fight in an area, the government suspected the local people are supporting the rebels. The rebels are saying that the local people are supporting the government, so people are, have to run for their lives. When we came here into the house, the same question is being asked, why the war has not ended? He said, because some people in Acholi must be supporting them, because no gorilla can ever fight a war or resist a government for so long unless they get some support from the local population. Not only did the government fail to provide resources and humanitarian aid to the camps, but perhaps even worse, they failed to provide any kind of protection to the camps. And this was first sort of brought home to me in when I began doing research in northern Uganda in 2001. I visited one camp of 45,000 people that only had 40 soldiers. They weren't even regular army soldiers, they were rather home guard. In other words, most of the time, teenagers who were given a gun and $20 a month and told to protect the camp. Another camp of 15,000 people had 12 home guard, quote, protecting it. Uh, the night when, uh, when the rebels attacked uh, the seminary here, there were about five uh, UPDF soldiers. But when they saw the rebels in big number, they disappeared. And uh, the seminarians and the people, the population here, we, were, we felt completely abandoned without any protection. Because if there was protection, the seminarians would have not been abducted. They would have been protected. So this also tells you the challenge of this conflict that has lasted for 20 years. And it tells you that really the military solution is not enough. You know, it's not enough. So it's what people often call the grasshopper theory of northern Uganda, that the government has um, just left the rebels, left all the different factions and armed factions to just kill each other off uh, because they're, in a sense, doing the government's job for it. Um, but the problem is that that's not a politically progressive attitude in any way. And what happens to a civilian population in a context like that is that not only are they going to become alienated from the rebels, which is what the government wants, but they're going to become alienated from the government as well because they're going to see the government as just abandoning them to these armed forces. So in a number of times, the government, if it had stepped in and take, taken a responsible role and said, we will protect you civilians from you know, the ravages of these different rebel groups that are in existence, I think that they probably could have built a significant political relationship with the Acholi peasantry. 
but they never did that. They always chose instead of moving in and helping and protecting, moving out and saying, ah, you guys can kill each other off, we don't care. And people know that. And the grasshopper, they, you, you can talk to anybody in any refugee camp, not anybody, but you can talk to people in, in the internment camps in Northern Uganda, and most people have heard of this theory, or at least can express this idea that the government is just has abandoned them to be killed by the rebels and the different armies and factions and whatnot that are in Northern Uganda. Uh, but the people, if you, if you go there, the people are being harassed both sides. People have suffered in the hands of the rebels. They have suffered in the hands of uh, NRA, because NRA suspect the people, and the people, and then the, the rebels suspect the people. There is a need to stop Museveni from making us fear our brothers from Achori, because that's the culture they have constructed amongst us. Of course, for me, those people who say that Museveni um, is preparing a dynasty I now let me tell you I trusted that man I really believed and trusted him he betrayed me I feel betrayed and I told him I told him you betrayed me because I trusted him I didn't expect President Museveni to behave like his predecessors never never but when they talk of his dynasty I mean what do you imagine his wife now a member of parliament. What did, <coughs> what is it that the first lady could not do in her position as a first lady that she now wants to do as a member of parliament? And you know, I was very, very close to her. So I, what couldn't she do that she has to do now when she's in parliament? Now she's in parliament, his brother is a minister, his son has been promoted year after year, year after year. Those people went to Ames who even came from the bush. Some of them have not attained the rank of President Museveni's son. But for him, year after year, he's being promoted. And for me, I believe he's being prepared to become the army commander. One of these days, I think maybe before the, the five years, the guy will be the army commander. And then you remember his brother, so the younger one who used to be a nobody. <laughs> you should have seen him in Barara calling me, fighting me. Where was he from that one? But he contested to be a member of parliament of Nyabshozi. And then the sister of Mrs. Museven also contested to be a member of parliament for Nyabshozi. If you don't call that a dynasty, what do you call it? The psychophants, I'm telling you, the, the government, the government of President Museven now is pure psychophants. And I say it without any fear, because they are. Because I know the sincerity of President Uwezo Museven. I've talked with him, I've been in meetings with him. You know, this is a conspiracy which I will not stand. Because we have billionaires in Museven's family. When people are starving, this wealth, the national wealth, has to be redistributed evenly to all people. The NGOs, the non-governmental organizations and aid groups want to call these people internally displaced people or IDP so as to hide the fact that they're actually interned in forced displacement camps, that they've been forcibly displaced by their government into internment camps. And they hide that, and thus they sort of you know, push back or sort of ignore the questions of complicity that arise through their you know, cooperation with the government in maintaining this population as displaced by maintaining this population in prison camps, internment camps. A whole language has been developed to facilitate this, and the international community has been complicit in disseminating this language, in using this language, in accepting this language. The NGOs came in, gave us a hand in giving out uh, relief in terms of food, drugs, um, food, drugs, and secondhand clothes. Well over half of their caloric intake comes from um, World Food Program, comes from foreign humanitarian agencies. Which, of course, raises an interesting question. Um, 
in a situation of forced displacement, in a context where a government burns down villages, bombs villages, threatens people, forces people into concentration camps, when foreign aid agencies, when the UN, when World Food Program, when World Vision, Norwegian Refugee Council, when these groups come in and start giving food, providing food in internment camps, start digging wells in concentration camps, are they complicit in the violence itself? Are they complicit in maintaining these camps? That international community has been complicit in this genocide. They have been complicit at every stage of the program leading to this genocide. Prior to people being forced into camps, northern Uganda was the base of food production for the rest of Uganda. Upland rice production has hit a bumper harvest in Gulu this year, and so has Simsim. Within the town, there are seven mills, but these are not able to cope with the quantity of rice brought in daily from the villages. And behind this bumper are simple peasants, most of them returnees after the war. With their potatoes, cow peas, simsim, groundnuts, and now rice, these people have made an impact on the national food situation. The district administrator, Mr. Ochaya, explains the role of his office in the pacification and rehabilitation of the district. There's a lot. number of NGOs, as well as the UN agencies, responded to the plight of these internally displaced people in various ways. But on many occasions, the relief was like too small coming too late. Mzee Benjamin Obalim, a respected elder, has seen it all from the beginning. Muranga. Mere run and yogi. Muranga. Bero kilo. Areo. Ma. Ten nusu later. Mere magi poro king ara chela chela. Si dong yini poro eno. Kado yin ki mini kila dek ni champi du a chel. Kerini gu nyo haka ken. Ho ma be. In the past, there were thriving markets and an abundance of food. Now this is what is left of the once thriving marketplace. I'm going to go But what message do the NGOs send when they come in to internment camps and feed the population there and thus make the entire system whereby over a million people are forced to live in squalid internment camps, dying a thousand people a week? NGOs are coming and maintaining this entire system. They're allowing the massive displacement of the Acholi population to continue by coming in and providing food and providing uh, digging boreholes and building schools in the camps and everything. How come those government institutions that advocate human rights, that 
say never again would support a regime that is doing this to us. What shall we tell our children in northern Uganda? Shall we tell them that for, for all these years we didn't know what was going on? If we look at other places where, the gov where governments have attempted this kind of forced displacement, for example Burundi, the international community wouldn't let it happen. They just simply said, no, you're not allowed to do this. We're not going to stand by while you, you know, force a large section of your population into concentration camps. And we're certainly not going to go and then, you know, support these concentration camps. You know, uh, I, I recall about the same time that the Museveni regime began to uproot people from the villages and congregate them in the so-called protected villages. About that very same time, in Burundi, the government began to uproot people from their villages and congregate them in the same way. They were called Kond or Grupomo. Assembly camps, protected villages, and the rationale was exactly the same. The rationale was the rural populations are being attacked by rebels. They're in danger of, of, uh, uh, from the rebels. The government wants to uproot them, assemble them in particular places where the government can protect them. What was the reaction of the international community? They said nothing doing. They saw right through um, that Hamburg said nothing doing. This is a pretext, this is an excuse to do in the rural population, most of whom were Hutus. So the international community, the United Nations, human rights group, everybody, the European Union said you've got to dismantle these camps. You've got to allow the rural populations to go back to their homes and villages. And you know what? The pressure was so strong within months the Kond or Groupement were dismantled and the populations went back to their homes within months. We are dying here when you talk of 1,000 per week, it's not the case. It is even more than that. We are being killed, we are dying by, with disease, we are being underfed, under some go and die elsewhere. We are in the condition that we never had before. We are not in the houses that we never lived in before. This is a disaster. But this government does not accept that we are in a disaster area. Why? What shall we tell them when they ask, how come nobody came to stop the catastrophe? the genocide, the nightmare stalking our land, destroying our people. What shall we tell the children? What shall we tell them when they ask, how come the defenders of human rights, those in whom we had faith, to come to our rescue, to speak out for us, to denounce what is happening to us, how come these very institutions and governments and organizations became the sponsors, the, the supporters, offering succor and comfort to the very regime that is doing this to us. The church is putting a lot of emphasis on the ministry of evangelism. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord for what? What are you praising God for? When people are dying in Rwanda, you keep quiet. When people are dying in, in, in northern Uganda, you keep quiet. 
when people are dying in Sudan, you keep quiet. Now you see, praise the Lord. Is it for money? Is it for position? For what? Tell us. Time has come for us in Ghana to stand together. I think there are two reasons why um, people are reluctant to use the word genocide. Uh, the first is a misunderstanding of the definition of the word genocide. Uh, uh, most people who, uh, who think about the word genocide have never read the Genocide Convention and so they don't know the definition, uh, which is the intentional destruction in whole or in part, I underline the in part of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. You don't have to intend to destroy the whole group for it to be a genocide or to be an act of genocide. Uh, and so uh, what you have are a lot of people who use what I call the all or none school of genocide, uh, who only would use the word for genocides in whole, uh, the Holocaust or Rwanda uh, um, or the Armenian genocide, where the objective was to in fact wipe out all of the other group. And so they, uh, they and if it doesn't reach that level, they won't use the word. I think that's one of the most common problems. Uh, I think the, the second problem is uh, a problem of political will. People who don't want to use the word genocide often don't want to use it because they don't want to do anything. Genocide is a potent word. It carries not only legal implications, it carries moral implications. It's the crime of crimes. And if you call something genocide, it creates either a legal obligation or a moral obligation. I think more strongly, in fact, a moral obligation to act, to do something, to stop it, uh, or to prevent it. And a lot, of, a lot of countries, a lot of states don't like to feel obligated to do anything. They'd like to just sit back in their nice comfortable capitals and let that genocide happen somewhere around the world to people who really don't count. And that is, I think, the main reason why the word genocide is now used.